Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're in Acts chapter 9, and we are carrying on with Adrian from last week as we discuss uh, Saul and the conversion of Saul and some of the things that we can extract from the account of the conversion of Saul and how they apply to today's spirituality, the church, etc. and so forth. If you enjoy what you're getting here, we invite you to support the channel. The, the uh, details to do so are in the description below this video so we appreciate everybody who supports the ministry we could not do this without you and without further ado as james white would say um adrian welcome back hey there glad to be here <laughs> uh glad to have you here so for those who don't know we've uh we've been doing some pre-gaming here a little bit uh <laughs> We were supposed to start filming about an hour and 11 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been discussing things that are relevant to this. And we're like, we should capture this. We should capture this. And so I'm, just, I'm like, okay, I'm hitting the record button. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we so said that, that a few times and we didn't record until now. <laughs> right. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> now, last week we had an audio issue which turned out to be a problem on my end um, because when we heard the recording we could still hear you but i couldn't hear you so if that pops up again uh we'll we'll troubleshoot that a different way now where we left off we're, so in acts chapter 9 what's happening in acts chapter 9 is saul who happens to be the apostle to the gentiles um is being stopped in his tracks by a vision from God, from Jesus Christ, who talks with him. And Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, we find out later in, in the book, uh, either first or second Timothy, where it says, what happened to me is a pattern. So it's, it's interesting to study what happened to Paul and to think about his impact on the church and the resultant vector that he had on the church. So where we got cut off last week, when we started losing audio, I think you were trying to make a comment about Acts chapter 9, verse 6. Yeah. And that's where we left off. So if you remember where you were, mm -hmm. what did you have in mind about Acts 9, 6? Yeah. So you were talking about a new believers class, and instead of giving them propositions you know, they might have them come up with a statement of faith. And instead of th um, them coming up with a list of things to believe, they may come up with a list of things that Christians should do. And so that rang a bell in my mind about Acts 9, 6, because when Paul has that encounter with Jesus, he says, you know, what wilt thou have, have me do? So we see there that once he's confronted with Jesus, and he realizes the truth, he is not asking for more propositions. He's not asking what else he is supposed to believe. What he's saying to Jesus is, what am I supposed to do in light of the fact that I now know the truth? And yeah, he didn't say, what, what will you have me to believe? What yeah. is my new statement of faith? What are, the, <laughs> what, are the, what are the essentials of the faith now, Lord? What are my new essentials? Yeah. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> yeah. And I think it just, and we were talking about this earlier during the pregame, that um, there are the standard things that we're supposed to do as Christians, you know, in terms of witnessing to people and sharing the gospel. But I think following the way of Jesus Christ is there's more to it than that. And there's an area of that arena that I feel like we're not operating in. Like there's some doing that's supposed to be happening in relation to our transformation that's not taking place. So, so when you say that, what's happening in my mind is a realization of where the focus is mm -hmm. of uh, so the focus of church seems to be outreach and the afterlife and out, so, so outreach the afterlife and 
propositional truth sets, mm -hmm. propositional truth claims like statements of faith. And it's almost like, uh, it's almost like the things that connect the afterlife and the outreach is that, that statement of faith, that proposes the set of statements of what we think are true. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so it's like, <laughs> it's like when you invite people to trust Christ, really what's happening, those are the words you're saying. <laughs> but it's almost like we're inviting people to be ideologically possessed by the truth claims that we think are true. Yeah. It's like, here's a list of what to believe. Take this, hold on to it for dear life, and share it with as many people as possible before you die. Right. So it's, <laughs> if, if you were to imagine any, any mind, like a, an ideological possession, a paradigm, kind of like an organism, like a bacteria yeah. and people are the soil in which it spreads itself. And when it gets a hold of the people, it causes them to be meme propagators of itself because its job is to spread itself. You think of it like a virus or a bacteria. It's like a mind yeah. virus. And it wants to spread itself. Now that that is irrespective of whether or not it's true. Mm. You see, the propositional truth mm -hmm. claims might be true, but merely affirming them does not necessarily transform the individual. Yeah. I'm concerned. I'm concerned about... I don't, I'm really worried about this focus on the afterlife. And it's yeah. not that I don't think it's true, but I think Viktor Frankl, he illustrated this so well when he was talking about the concentration camps. You had some people in the concentration camps that all they could see was, you know, being rescued. All they could see is being rescued. And they would get these, these really these myths evolved during World War II, like, mm -hmm. Okay, this Christmas we're going to be saved. The war's going to be over. We're going to be delivered. We're going to be brought out of here. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then when that didn't happen, that's all they had to look forward to. Those people who were looking forward to be saved at Christmas were dead by February when it didn't happen. Are you referencing um, Man's Search for Meaning? I don't remember the name of the book. That might be it. I think so. That's. Because that sounds familiar to me by Victor Frankl. Yeah. So, and I think that and I th even Nietzsche says some stuff like this. Now, just mentioning these names, people are going to say that we're going to philosophy and not to the Bible. <laughs> but the, if, if you want to fool somebody, and I'm not saying Christianity is fooling anybody, but if you want to fool somebody, what you do is you promise something that they can't verify and you usually do so by moving it out into the future. For example, if you want to fool somebody politically about, say, global warming or something like that, you tell them, in 30 years, X, Y, Z. Well, you can't prove that because nobody's in 30 years from now. Yeah. Well, the logical progression <laughs> of continuing to move things out into the future is just to go ahead and stick it on in the afterlife. Now, yeah. who can prove that? And so if I have this concern that if all of our focus – now, I'm, I have 1 Corinthians fifteen nineteen in my head right now for those – if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. I'm aware of that. But if all of our focus is just on the afterlife, I feel like we're these concentration camp people where <laughs> we we are not being the best version of ourselves here. Yeah, yeah. It makes me think of uh, the word for sin, harpazo. Is that it? No, that's rapture. And I made the same mistake in one of my videos. <laughs> yeah. What, Harmatia is yeah, sin. Harpazo is the catching the away. Rapture, yeah. Um, so, Harmatia. Harmatia. Mm -hmm. yep. Missing the yep. mark. Um, and it makes me think of how there, God has a goal for us. He has a mission. And we're supposed to have an aim. And yep. it's more than just getting saved and knowing that you're going to heaven. So it's funny. I told you yesterday, I think it, no, Thursday, I was taking um, the class on time management and productivity. And she yep. was talking about goals. And she asked the class, what is a goal? And I said, a goal is something that you're aiming for that is going to orient your thinking, your doing, and your being. 
And I think in Christianity, we are not understanding the bigger picture of what God's goal is for us. And because of that, our thinking, doing, and being are not fully oriented in the right way. And so let me, can I focus in on one of those words there? Yeah. Being, being, mm -hmm. um, the being aspect, I mean, back to Viktor Frankl, no matter what the Nazi prison guards could take away from you, they could not take away your choice of how you were going to be. The, the one thing you had left that made you a human was your choice. Mm-hmm of how you were, the, the integrity of you and how you were going to be. And the goal, like even when you're surrounded by whatever is at a concentration camp, which is, you know, understandably horrible, you can still be a certain way from day to day. You don't have anything, but you have, you can be. And when you're talking about being, and then the mark, and this, you're oriented, and there's a certain way of being, mm -hmm. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And um, this is a big question is like, what does that mark look like for me practically? What is that mark? So if sin is missing the mark, what is that mark? If yeah. Paul, Saul is asking, what wilt thou have me to do? There is a, Paul has to transform into something. And it looks like it takes about three years. If you, if you look at the various passages of scripture, uh, go between Acts 9 and Acts 13 and Galatians chapter 1 and 2 and Ephesians 3. It looks like Paul spends about three years after this event before he's ready to come out with a message and start leading mm -hmm. in in the way that they call heresy, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's this transformation process. He, he needs to be something different and new. He needs to be yeah. something different and new. He doesn't need to have anything new. And I think what's when we talk about these propositional truth claims, this statement of faith, we are trying to get converts to come willfully affirm that these things that we believe are true, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are metaphysical truth claims that we can't prove. And then once you have those beliefs, you have those beliefs. It, you have it in having mode. Mm -hmm. I have something. And then people tend to identify with what they have instead of what they're being. I had a conversation with my 11-year-old daughter. We were talking about boyfriends and girlfriends because she's, you know, getting to that age where she's kind of interested in boys, you know. And I was trying to say, like, in relationships, you want to think about not what you have. It's, it's not that I have a wife. It's that I can be a husband. Mm -hmm. It's not that I – because I can't have more of a wife than I had yesterday. I guess I could feed her a sandwich or something. But I can't <laughs> – I can't have, you know, I can't have better than I'm having now, yeah. but I can be a better husband tomorrow than I was today. Yeah. I can't, I can't have kids in a, you know, I have kids. I have four kids. I can't have them qu more qualitatively than I do now, but I can be a qualitatively better father right. to them than I am yeah. now. So like in the relationships in your life, you're thinking about being in and there's this reciprocal opening with the relationships that you have in your life where you are both transforming into a higher level of being mm -hmm. and you're not in having mode. I, mm -hmm. I mean, Paula is not a, <laughs> she is not a fungible, interchangeable part that I can just swap out for some other woman. She, we, she and I are, are helping each other be better. Yeah. It's, not, it's not something I have. She's not a car or a house. <laughs> You know what I mean? She's she's not a belonging. Yeah. And so with Christians, we God is God is reduced to a systematic theology and it's something people have. Mm -hmm. It's not a reciprocal opening relationship with God where they are being better every day. Which kind of, you know, you talked about I can't remember if we talked about it in the video or offline about it seems that church is not helping people transform into better modes of being yeah. yeah they want you to go but they can't tell you how they're helping you do that 
Um, oh. Is it in Romans uh, where it says, if anyone knows what he ought to do and does not do it to him, it is sin? That sounds like Romans fourteen seventeen. Yeah. Um, or fourteen thirteen. Uh, oh, I have the search function still on. So I mentioned that because I think that the concept of sin and the concept of missing the mark, the so whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Hmm. Um, and uh, maybe I'm thinking of James four seventeen, where it says, "Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin." Mm, yeah, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah, well, it, it's Romans fourteen twenty three and James four seventeen. I've frequently thought of them together. Mm-hmm. Because they both kind of tell you what sin is in a way. Yeah. And I think there's a sense in which I'm trying to connect the dots here. So it's like a sin of omission. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think sin is more than violating the Ten Commandments. So if God has a mission for you, he has an aim, he has a mark that he wants you to um, hit and anything that steers you away from that mark is sin even if that thing that steers you away is not necessarily a ten commandments violation and i think that that's Look, something can, that I, can I take this into a non-religious realm real quick sure yeah this is an idea that i have You watch football. (laughs) This is just my idea. These are guys with like huge amounts of hair. However they want to have their hair, I'm all for it. I'm all for whatever. Have your style. It's great. My thinking though is that at a professional level sport, a tenth of a second on a 40 meter dash or a 40 yard dash (laughs) could make the difference between winning the game and not to me the bible says lay aside every weight and the Mm. sin which just so easily beset it so you're not breaking a rule by having 10 pounds of hair on your head right but if you could run a half second faster when you're going for that pass or trying to outrun the other guys is it You know, are you in bad faith with your teammates by adding that to what you got going on when you possibly could be a shred better without that? Yeah. So that's, you're not breaking a rule. You see what right, I'm saying? You're not breaking a right. rule, but it's like a it's like a weight where maybe you could do better without it. Yeah. And that makes my mind go to the conversation we've been having lately about discernment. Because I think if you're that football player you have to be able to discern, you know, I'm not breaking a rule. However, there is a goal I'm supposed to be achieving. And it's possible that this hair is hindering me from performing at the capacity that I could perform at to achieve the the goal in a better way. Right, right. Yeah, but if you don't have, if you're very much in a propositional mental framing of as long as I'm operating within the boundaries of this prescribed set of rules that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, if you're operating in that mental framework, you don't have the ability to to discern that, oh, here's this other thing that I'm doing that may not be helping me achieve the what I'm aiming for, because in your mind, well, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I'm following this list of rules that's written down in a rule book. And yet you are carrying an additional weight that's causing you that may, may, right, right. may not cause you to miss the mark. So so the, your assessment of sin could mm-hmm. be read. It's now I know the Bible says sin is transgression of the law. Right. I get that. But we also have passages that say the law was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way. And where there is no law, there is no, you know, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Mm -hmm. And it it almost, it seems like the new 
assessment of sin is once you have established your mark, anything that prevents you from getting to that mark mm -hmm. as effectively or efficiently as you possibly can is the new sin. Yeah. Yeah. That's sin now. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and getting to that mark, there could be times when getting to that mark might violate what would be considered, you know, a sin in other ways. And I'm trying to think of an example and I'm sure everybody Rahab. would fuss with an example if I had one. Yeah. Rahab, the session that we did about methodological. Oh, that's a good session. one. That's a really good one. And she lied good one. to hide she the She lied. Spies. Yep. She yeah. lied to hide the spies and then she's in the hall of faith for what she did. Exactly. So she broke a rule about not bearing false witness. Mm -hmm. And uh, lying lips, Proverbs 6, you know, God right. hates lying lips. Well, not in that case. Yeah. She broke because, the rule and she knew when to do it. Right. What she did in that instance was the right thing to do in order to achieve the aim that was being required in that circumstance. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's now, I hope good. people don't think that we're telling them to lie now. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, we're not. See, that's, yeah. it's, it's hard to talk about this. Yeah. Um, coming from an independent Baptist background, everything everything had to be this exact same rules for everybody. And if you didn't agree to that, then you're just trying to excuse and justify a license to sin in your own life. That's how they see it. That's and funny. then that's how this conversation is going to be interpreted. <laughs> that, oh, you're just trying to find a loophole to justify the sin that you want to do in your life. Right. And now. that's that's not the point. It's it's more right. like, um, you know, we talked about that movie, uh, World War Z, when mm -hmm. Brad Pitt's character cuts off the arm of that Israeli soldier. Yeah. Well, if you go cutting people's arms off, you're going to go to jail. <laughs> you know, Under that's a bad thing to yeah. do. Yeah. Except in that situation where that action saved that person's life. Exactly. And yeah. So you can't you can't be taught that. You have to you have to exercise wisdom on the spot for when to break the rules mm -hmm. and when it's the right thing to do to break the rules. Yeah, this makes me think of um, alcohol. So there's this other channel that I watch. Oh boy, we're gonna get a lot of comments now. <laughs> and he's an independent Baptist, and he says, you know, when you book, when you come to Christ, you can drink as much as you want to. But the thing is, now you don't want to. And I think about the alcohol situation. And I again, that I think that's an issue of discernment. People think either you're sober or you're plastered. And that's it. If you're not sober, you're wasted. And it's like, me, well, hmm. no. Each person has their own limit. It's different for every person. And each person should know what their limit is and be able to discern, okay, when am I crossing the line? Let me, so, let me give you a, well, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah. I was going to say, so me personally, I know I can't do more than two glasses of anything. Uh -huh. I know if I do more than go do more than two glasses, I am slipping into the realm of not being in a state of sobriety. And so yeah. when I have wine or, you know, any kind of drink, I exercise that discernment. I exercise self-control and I make sure that I don't go past that limit. Now, someone else, I have a friend who I know can have five or six drinks and he's just fine. He's not a believer. So he, I guess he can be plastered if he wants to, <laughs> <laughs> but he can have that many drinks. And be fine. So if he were a believer, maybe his line is five drinks. It's not black and white. It's not sober well, or faster. It, it it seems that people have a superstition associated with particular things. Mm -hmm. Like if you grew up in a household, it has to be teetotalers. And then Paul says something like he says to, which I did. I grew up in a teetotaler house. Um, and then I had a teetotaler house for a while. <laughs> What is that? I'm not familiar with that. Teetotaler means uh, you don't even cook with wine. There's no alcohol in the house. 
Um, you got to well, pray the demons out of NyQuil when you buy it. You know, <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah, I guess that's, uh, some people don't know what teetotaler is. I found somebody else that said that too, but that's a, that's a thing. So when people have like a teetotaler thing and then Paul comes along and tells Timothy, drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Well, he had Luke, a physician with him who is, there's probably some background information there where Timothy's like, you know, I got this thing going on with my stomach. And then Luke, who's a medical doctor, right. is like, mm-hmm. wine's going to help you with that. Drink a little wine. And so then all the independent Baptists are like, that doesn't mean alcoholic wine. And it's just so <laughs> superstitious about these things. Let me give you another example, because that's a, that's a hot button issue that a lot of people like to argue about, right? And I used to have... <laughs> I've been willing to readdress that issue, but let me give you let me give you a different issue so that people aren't distracted by the example that's used. Yeah, um, Can I just tattoos. interject really quickly and say something. Yeah, go ahead. I think um, what I'm getting at is that people would rather have black and white answers than to know personally and and individually what's right and what's wrong for them. Yeah, they'd rather things be black and white. Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly right. I knew a tale of two guys. They both had prostate cancer. Neither one of them believed in tattoos. They're both like Leviticus 19.28, all the way. I don't believe in tattoos. I'm not going to print any marks upon me. Don't support tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Well, they both go, they both get prostate cancer about the same time. They both go to the same place to get treated for prostate cancer. And it's like a, it's like an experimental treatment and the, here's what they said they're like we're going to line this machine up through your hips and we're going to shoot your prostate with this laser or some, whatever they shot it with but to make sure it, it requires several treatments and the machine has to be lined up exactly the same way every time now mm-hmm. the best way to do this <laughs> is we're going to put a tattoo a little dot just a little dot on this hip and on this hip so that when we put you in the machine next time, it's exactly the same way every time. Yeah. One guy said, tap me up. Let's do it. And the other guy was so against tattoos, he was like, nope, I'm not doing it. I want you to realign the machine as best you can every time. That dude died in 2006. Whoa. The other one is still going. Mm. So it's like you have, it's like they're so against this particular thing mm-hmm. that they have a superstition about it and they don't realize there is a time to break that rule. And I think yes. that when you have prostate cancer and you're getting treatment, I think that's the time to break the tattoo rule. Yeah. But there yes. was, you see what I'm saying? They're and so instead against. Of, instead of exercising this, discernment, he just stuck with his black and white thinking. Yeah, exactly. Which is so tattoo. stupid. And yeah. Instead of pressing for the most abundant life you could possibly have, which I think would be rule number one, he's got this little rule over here that stopped him from doing that. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, <laughs> that that's the kind of thing we're dealing with in Christianity, where mm-hmm. there's a lot of things Christians th- Christians aren't particularly aiming for anything. I'm thinking of some people right now who basically their life is to sit and, you know, just they're, they're not doing anything wrong, mm-hmm. but they're not doing anything right either. They're sitting in a recliner all day long and being frumpy all day long and not doing anything for God. They're just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's mm-hmm. not, that's just as sinful. I mean, they might as well be shooting up heroin. They're just as useful. <laughs> yeah. I, they really are. They might I, as well be completely spaced out all the time. They're absolutely just as useful. Yeah, I think we've definitely uh, oversimplified what well, our lives as Christians now. are su- is supposed to look like. Yep, like, yep. if I don't break any of the Ten Commandments, if I'm a nice person, if I pass out gospel tracts to people or leave one for my waitress at the restaurant and I go to church however many times a week my church meets. If I pray every day, if I read my Bible every day, now I'm doing the thing. And none of those things are wrong. None of those things are bad. 
but I just somehow get the sense that our aim is bigger than that. So I think about I think about David for an example. <laughs> a lot of people or people that I've encountered personally, they are confused as to why David was considered a man after God's own heart because he yep. committed sin. Yeah. And I think about it like this. Say I have two children and I've assigned a specific mission to each children. So both of my children have an aim. Both of my children have an aim. And I have one child and I've, of course, I've established rules for my household. And I have one child who follows all of the rules. Yep. And then I have another child who doesn't follow all the rules, but every day they get up and get out of bed they are striving towards the goal that I have set before them. And I think that Christians, they don't realize that God, of course God doesn't want us to sin, but what he wants for us is bigger than not sinning. His, his plan and his goal and his intention for us is more than that. I think not sinning is a part of that because, of course, you may commit sin in such a way that it will steer you away from the mark. It'll deter you or distract yep, yep. you from the mission. It'll take you away from that aim. Exactly. Take you away from that mark. Exactly. But, you know, which child am I going to favor more? The one who follows all the rules? and is not progressing towards the goal that I've set before them or the one who doesn't follow all the rules, but is going trending consistently daily in the direction of the goal that I've set before them. That concept is so insightful. It's so insightful. I, I, like I think of times in the military where you have, Guy, like the guys that are kind of nerdy and they're doing all the things right that they're told to do. Yeah. They they wonder why they don't get promoted. And the guys over here, that, are, but the guys who, uh, how do I word this? <laughs> the guys that are not like that tend to make better leaders. Mm-hmm because they know when to make decisions outside the box. And really, like especially in a military situation, a lot of times it's life and death when you have to make a call and you there are no rule books to follow the situation that's presented itself to you. Yeah, they know, you know when to cut someone's arm off. That's what makes a leader. And so in, like in the military, <laughs> a lot of times what you'll see is the guy that's following all the rules is not going to be the best leader and he's not the one that gets promoted. And the one that mm -hmm. is kind of innovative and bends the rules not that they're wrong or crooked but they're trying to make the mission happen and yeah. they have a record and a trend of trying to make the mission happen those guys get selected they get the awards they get promoted and that's i think that's right they should but it's frustrating to the guys who think they're doing all the right things but don't get that you know that pressing toward the mark mm -hmm. concept they don't get that and i think there's a lot of christians that way they're following, they're reading their Bible, they're going to church, they're not doing anything wrong, but they're not doing yeah. anything right either. Yeah. They're sitting on their blessed assurance. They're they're not particularly <laughs> doing they're not particularly doing anything that's making any kind of difference. Yeah. They're just they're just existing while while not shooting up heroin or listening to rock and roll. You know, and those <laughs> those things aren't virtues. Yeah. To to, to not do bad things or not that, that's not the virtue. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to figure out how can we get people out of that mental framing to realize that there's a bigger picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at let's look at Paul here. Let's look at um Paul asked this question in Acts 9 6. What wilt thou have me to do? Mm. Well, what was he already doing? Follow all the rules. In Philippians 3, 4, he says, 
Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now, mm -hmm. flesh here would be your capacity to the, follow the rote rules. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee, which is another way of saying, you know, impeccable. Im yeah. Impeccable service, you know, admirable, <laughs> impeccable service to the law keeping the law concerning zeal now not only not only was he keeping the law impeccably but he had, he was zealous he had some fervor he was concerning zeal persecuting the church the righteousness which is in the law and it seems like if you take a but paul doing all these things he's, he's very zealous he's very intent wants to wants to do he wants to serve mm -hmm. while following the rules completely missing the mark doing <laughs> all the wrong things yeah <laughs> and he comes to this place on the road to damascus where he's like he has to ask the question it, it's almost like those guys lord lord have we not cast out demons in thy name it's like it's like i'm doing stuff i'm doing all these things everything that sh could you know should or could possibly be expected of somebody i'm doing them what would I have me to do? Yeah. What do you want me to do? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, kind of an exacerbate. I feel like I'm yelling now, but it, but it's kind of <laughs> like an, an exacer. He's like exacerbated to the point where I'm doing all this stuff. I'm following, but that's he's he's not oriented properly. He's not aimed at the right thing. Mm -hmm. He he's not pointed toward the right mark. Right, and that needs to get fixed first before. Yeah you can do what you're supposed to do. And interestingly, if this is a pattern, if Paul, <laughs> one of the things we talked about was who are the Sauls of today? Mm -hmm. And we have a guy here who is following all the rules, who is the biggest physical obstacle to the people who are actually oriented properly. Yeah. He's trying to stop them, mm -hmm. he's stigmatizing them. He's he's established in his in group, and he's taking he you know he's trying to censor them. Trying to he's he's helping maintain the gated institutional narrative. You know, there's a certain he's yeah. he's attached to it. There's a there's a certain narrative you're allowed to talk about, and it has to be X Y Z, and it can't be people following the way that we call heresy. You know, the way <laughs> followers of the way. We have to stomp that out. We have to censor it practice censorship, block them out of being able to speak and get rid of these people. Who's doing that today? <laughs> you know who. <laughs> yeah, I think. Oh, my little uh, my little blankets come off my chair. <laughs> people can see my chair. Yeah, I think that <laughs> that is what the church is doing in general, and we talked about this before, that we're not doing anything wrong here, and yet we know, like we joke about this being a heresy fest. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're not doing anything wrong, and yet we know that because of the mental framing that something some people have, if they were to look at your content, they would think that we have just gone astray where well, they do yeah they, yeah, they try to map you to everything bad yeah like who who in church history believes what you did and i mean they, everything is they try to delegitimize uh make you not credible and all the way up to you're just david Koresh. yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. They that's, the, are... that's what i that's what I heard over and over from the guy that does the irresistible truth thing, uh, Derek Mural. He's like, "Oh, you're David Clark. That's all he's got. So he can't actually engage the material itself. He can't operate on that level. First of all, he's not mentally yeah. apt to do so. But they, these people, they just try to map you to horrible things. That's yeah. that's all they've got to do. Yeah, that's the, that's the their church, only card, really. Yeah, the church today is doing what Paul did in that they are defending the pre-established gated institutional narrative. Absolutely. And anything outside of the boundaries of that. Censorship. 
it, yeah, anything outside of the boundaries of that is wrong. And we were talking about something earlier. I won't mention it specifically. Maybe we'll do a session on that later. And I was saying, you know, just to ask a question about these, the set of beliefs that we have is just to some people, you're, you've gone astray, you're a heretic. And, and it's just like, you know, we talked about, you know, what the Bible actually says versus what people claim the Bible teaches. And whenever right, you right. try to point out that what the Bible says is not aligned with what someone claims that it teaches, instead of them questioning what they've been taught, they will respond to you talk, telling them what the Bible says by just repeating what they've been told that it teaches. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like, well, okay, I understand that this is what someone taught you. And I understand that all the great giants of the faith and brother Melms and yep, all of those people exactly right. <laughs> are in agreement, but let's look at what the scripture actually says and let's, acknowledge the dissonance between what scripture says and, and what, what we've been teach. taught. Yep. And it's different. It's very different. Yeah. And so something else that I brought up earlier that, that occurs to me. So, you know, somebody said on Facebook, I forget what it was, but it was a particular doctrine. They're like, does the Bible teach this or what does the Bible teach about this? And so when a when a paradigmatically entrapped mind talks about what the Bible teaches, what they have in mind is that the, the Bible is there like a textbook to try to teach you things like truth claims so that you can systematically game a whole, you know, gather a whole bunch of truth claims into one little pile and have them. And the Bible is like, a, is like an input process into your valid set of facts that you hold as truth claims in your systematic theology and your statement of faith. And then, and then you have it and you have it in having mode and the Bible adds things to the things that you have in having mode where, and that's one way to approach the Bible. And it's not that the Bible's not true. Cause you know, we absolutely, we're all about some scripture only here <laughs> and we think it's true. It's part of our axioms, but the Bible is not trying to give you a set of things to have as factual truth claims. Yeah. It is it is designed to afford you transformation. Mm -hmm. And if you have a gathering facts posture versus afford me transformation posture, it is a completely different book. Mm. It's a completely yeah. different book. Yeah. So the Bible doesn't teach things it says things that are designed to transform you yeah. and if you look at it as in the sense of this is telling me this and my engagement with it is going to leave me qualitatively different yeah it's a completely different approach and that's mm -hmm. that's where we're trying to go with it that's that's what we're we're trying to and be transformed by the renewing of your mind we're trying to engage the scripture and let it transform us into a better mode of being mm -hmm. rather than just have all these have all these things yeah i believe in this i believe in that who <laughs> cares who cares what you believe show me show me that you're transformed well you, know, you... it's funny because you say that and their idea of showing you that they're transformed is well, I pray and I read my Bible every day and I go to church and I yeah. have, believe all the right doctrine. And I didn't do those things before and I'm doing them now. So that means that I'm transformed, right? That means so, I believe, right? That, that brings up something else you were, you were talking about earlier, like that kind of thing, that kind of approach. It's kind of like the things that you would have a kid do so that they have a base operating system for the culture. Mm-hmm. You know, so so going to school, studying that kind of thing, you're going you're going to function in the culture. You're probably going to be able to hold a job and socialize and those kinds of things. Maybe have a family and pay your bills, mm -hmm. but those things will not make you a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer necessarily specifically. So think about a computer, and if a Christian 
if you buy a computer, you we're both looking at computer screens right now, right? <laughs> so if you buy a computer, if I if I were to go buy a computer right now from Best Buy, not that I'm advertising for them and prop it up right here, I would not be able to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Like the the way we're talking, I have software on my computer. I have, let's see, I'm looking at three specifically different kinds of software right now that did not come with this computer. And all three of those are tied together in the way that we're talking right now. It's like mm -hmm. the visual aids. I'm using one set of software to talk and, da -da -da, and then I'm using another one to show this scripture over here, which is a different software too. The point is reading your Bible, praying, going to church makes the Christian a blank computer that you buy from the store that does not have any applications loaded on it yet that cannot really serve a purpose. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It, 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 it's like the equivalent of the phrase, keep them off the streets, keep the kids off the streets so they don't do anything bad. So yeah, maybe you're not doing anything bad, but you also don't have any specific aim uploaded onto your system. Yeah. That's just the base operating system. Mm -hmm. going, going to church and praying and reading your Bible, that's just the base operating system. The the spiritual discipline. <laughs> What's that? The fundamentals. Uh, yeah. The, We're the trying fundamentals. to get beyond the fundamentals here. Right. Yeah. Right. There was a yeah. meta. There was a beyond. There was an above. There's something. Once you got those fundamentals, now you're a computer operating system. Now it's time to load some applications on there so you can be used to do something specific. Mm -hmm. Like this, I use this computer to record videos. It has a specific purpose. Yeah. And it is sanctified for that purpose. If I want to do something else, I will use another device. I have one, two, three, I have three other computers over there and I want to do something else if I'm doing something for work, it's a different device. They're sanctified for a particular use. And that's how, that's how a Christian needs to be. You need to be set apart, sanctified mm -hmm. <laughs> to press toward a specific mark that is your vocational calling. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.1. Yeah. When you mention children. So I was in a setting recently where I was watching someone teach David and Goliath to fourth and fifth graders. And after they went through the story, they asked the children, what are the Goliaths in your life? And I said, oh, my God, I have heard the same exact application taught to grown adults. <laughs> I think David Jeremiah has a series on facing the giants in your life. Yeah. And then there's a movie, like a Christian movie called facing the giants and something like that. Yeah. And so I'm just like, if we're teaching the story from that angle, to children on that level because that's what they can understand by the time you're an adult shouldn't you have a broader greater understanding of that story and how to apply it to your life and how it connects to the overall narrative of scripture how is it that we're teaching children and adults the same application for the so I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh oh. <laughs> Actually, I do. I do want to put you on the spot. It's always interesting. With regard to the David and Goliath story. Oh no. What does that look like? What does that look like? Now well, I'm an adult. I heard. I heard. What are the giants in your life when I'm in fourth yeah. and fifth grade? Now I'm an adult. Now what do I do with that story? Mm. What should I be doing with it now? Putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, we can move on to something else if you want. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think I would have to process that to draw a conclusion. See, I'm just here to ask questions and challenge people. <laughs> I'm not promising any answers or any solutions. <laughs> not in the arena. I, sometimes I come up with a clever thing, but I'm the questioner, you know? There we go. <laughs> here to exercise my curiosity, so... I, I can't say that I have an answer to that. But if I take a little bit of time to process it 
And that, <laughs> that is a great question. And I said this to you earlier, I am I still trying response. to figure out in my life, what am I supposed to be doing? I know as a Christian, my aim is greater than, you know, prayer and reading scripture and going to church. And I know it's greater than that, but what am I supposed to be doing? Like actually practically day to day, how is what I know supposed to transform my thinking, doing, and being? And I'm still trying to find the answer to that question. I have so many things going through my head right now. <laughs> For real, I do, I do. Like, um, if David would not have slain Goliath, he also never would have seen Bathsheba. Mm. Yeah. You see, he never would, or, or if, you know, if those kinds of things, the butterfly effect, the mm -hmm. things that led up. Oh, um, now so, I'm, even, I'm thinking what I said earlier about. It's almost like when you grow and when you're doing stuff for Christ, when you're, when you're pressing toward the mark, mm -hmm. see that they never would have moved the capital to Jerusalem. They never would have moved the Ark of the Covenant. They never would have well, had Obed-Edom. Uzzah never Calvin. would have died. All of those. Oh things. yeah, if you ask a Calvinist, but that's okay. so not interesting. Because <laughs> that's, I mean, that's your base. I mean, really, if Calvinism were true, you really wouldn't need a Bible. You would need the first phrase of London Baptist Confession, chap uh, chapter three, paragraph one: mm -hmm. "God hath in Himself of His own free will, da 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 da, ordained whatsoever comes to pass." And then whatever comes to pass would be the Bible because God ordained everything, yeah. whether it's adultery or murder or whatever it is, it's all what God ordained to come to pass. So that would be your Bible. And that's the only sentence you would need. And yeah. the fact that we have sentences other than that in scripture implies strongly that that one isn't true. <laughs> yeah. But it's, about... it's almost like when you, when you get, okay, David, David slays a giant and I'm way off on a rabbit trail here, but my mind... <laughs> David slays a giant, but he succumbs to temptation. Mm -hmm. What well, that was a giant in his life, right? And he failed it. Yeah. And then I another mean, giant. What do you do about that? He killed yeah. Uzziah. Yeah, I'm thinking about the concept of David um, not following all the rules, but aiming for what God has set before him. Being a man after God's own heart, despite yeah, all and that. So I, I think the David and Goliath story is an example of, and I think another thing with David too is that he took God at his word. You know, God told Israel that he was going to hand their enemies over to them. And David believed him, despite of despite how things looked and so he couldn't just believe the proposition that the future greater better thing was going to come he had to actually participate in bringing it to pass right he had he to, had a role to play yeah he had to behave I mean, in accordance with that belief and and he had to go do what he had to do like so yeah there's this there's a standard way to fight a battle, and they tried this with David. This 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 goes back to rule following too. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. They they tried this with David. They're like, hey, if you're going to go fight a battle, here's how you fight a battle. You yeah. put on this armor, and you got a sword and a shield, and this <laughs> this is how you fight. And David, you know, he's like the Lars Anderson of battles. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's the world's best archer. And he has done so by breaking all the archery rules. Wow. I think his name is Lars Anderson. Go watch. If, if anybody's watching this video, Google Lars Anderson and watch the stuff he does. He does some weird stuff with some bow and arrows. But David <laughs> is so, un, he's, he's very unconventional, but he's the best. Yeah. And so, so David's like that. He's handed mm -hmm. all these rules. He's handed, okay, you're going to go fight this giant. Here's how we fight battles. And David's like, well, I will consider this, but that's not how I fight battles. <laughs> so there's like an established way of doing things mm -hmm. and he steps outside of the established way of doing things because he has attunement with how he operates in the arena of aggressors. Yeah. He already has attunement there. He's yeah. like, I've dealt with bears. I've dealt with lions mm -hmm. coming after yeah. my sheep and I've got this other 
you know, modality of addressing enemies. Let me do the modality with which I have procedural knowledge. Mm -hmm. I have attunement. I have procedural knowledge, perspectival knowledge with this other way of fighting, which involves a slingshot and no armor. Let me do it my way because I have attunement in that arena. And, and so it's like that that could be something like the mark that we have to press for. It's, yeah. you know, if David had to look to an example of somebody else who did it before, like who are all the people that killed giants and how did they do it? I don't think there's any slingshot ones that he had to learn from. Mm -hmm. He had to be innovative and he also had to know himself. Yeah. He had to have experience. He had to have participatory attunement with the arena. He had to know something about himself so that he could make a decision that was most appropriate for that arena. Now imagine being an Israelite and you see this kid with a slingshot and you are a trained soldier and you know all the standard procedures and practices for fighting a battle and you're looking at this kid. What do you think that they're thinking <laughs> when David walks the... and seeing with a slingshot? Um, the same thing, they're thinking the same thing that a seminary graduate thinks when they watch this channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet, David was the one who did what needed to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting... There's, he's like a trailblazer. Mm. Um, for that particular scenario, he was the most adept mm -hmm. to do it. That and they were out of options. They were out. I mean, they were about to surrender, and hey, we're slaves. <laughs> and and maybe you have to be there before you can make that kind of decision. But there's this thing of what are these what are these guys thinking? Like I try to put myself in their shoes. And it would probably be a mixture of disappointment and embarrassment. I mean, they would probably all just resign themselves to, hey, we're all about to be slaves. Because that's the agreement that we made. If they defeat our champion, we'll be slaves. And, you know, I mean, we're either going to fight or be slaves. So here it goes. Let's have it. Yeah. <laughs> um the standard institutional, gated institutional narrative, the people who are trained to do the thing in Christianity mm -hmm. are like those soldiers, mm -hmm. like Saul, Paul here. Yep. Um, they're so prepared, they're so trained. And I think I texted you early, earlier this morning before we started talking about how in the past, before the internet, before, say, 1995, and even for a while after the internet came, there was like an there's a there was an asymmetry I'm, so, I'm sorry i'm getting messages right now about a big event that's supposed to happen today that's getting canceled and now everybody's blowing up i'm going to have to close this app oh man <laughs> there's like this asymmetry of epistemology it's like an epistemic asymmetry to where and what i mean by epistemic asymmetry it's like how do we come to know what we should believe is true and when you're sitting in a pew in a church, especially before 1995, before the internet, most people have outsourced their epistemic modality to the person standing behind the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And they have earned that place in the game A modality by going to seminary. Well, now in 2021 you can pretty much replace seminary with uh, Bible software and access to Google. Yep. You can get the modes of all the Greek stuff. You can look up all the church <laughs> history stuff. Now, it, it does help to become familiarized with a whole a bunch of these things. It, do, it does help. But yeah. you at, the, at, at your fingertips, you have access to all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you have this what some people like Zach Stein call teacherly authority associated with the pastor 
and you have epistemic asymmetry associated with the pastor and the the regularity or the normativity of the in-group associated with that authority is this propositional set of truth claims like the statement of faith. And as long as you had a guy that was kind of like the arbiter of what belongs in the gated institutional narrative, like the pastor, there, there was like a little bit of safety there. So it kind of protected the in-group and what everybody's supposed to think is true and all this kind of stuff. Well, that, asymm- that epistemic asymmetry is gone. Mm. And now the teacherly authority is more institutional or bureaucratic. It's like a placeholder rather than a necessity because there is no epistemic asymmetry, or asymmetry anymore or, or that gap has been shortened very much. Like I have a degree in theology, but everything that I say to anybody can be verified or falsified if I'm if I claim some kind of historical thing or the Greek should have been this, this or this. Anybody can check me out in five seconds mm-hmm. and they couldn't do that before. You know, you you basically had to find somebody that you could trust and outsource your sense making to them. And that's we're not in that situation anymore. Yeah. So the. I guess it's a long way of saying that it was very easy before we had access to all this information for it to be propositionally information based and that to be the center of what church is. But now that we have all that information, we really don't need the pastor anymore unless he's got some kind of procedural leadership to offer us. Mm -hmm. If he's just telling me facts now, I don't need him for that. Nobody needs him for that. Yeah. But if he can, but if he's like a shepherd and he can guide me into that anagage, into that transformation, into a process of what to do with the information, Mm -hmm. that's what we need now. We need insight, not information. Yes, yes, yes. We need to cultivate insight, not just transmit information in a broadcast modality. So the old way of the pastor of a church is completely obsolete. We need somebody who can facilitate insight cultivation in an Ephesians 4.16 model. Yes. Which, which, so the process inertia that is infested, that's in all the churches, people, you know, like yourself, we, we complain about the churches. They've got that process inertia, that old modality that is obsolete now, which mm-hmm. needs to be completely revamped. I'll stop talking because I know you got something to say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about, we need insight that is going to transform i'm thinking about is it romans 12 to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that's going to transform our mind i always think about thinking doing and being if you change how you think and you change what you do you change who you become and information can't do that for you but insight can. Correct. Yeah. And we're not getting insight. So inf- information is quantitative, but the insight can be qualitative. I was just thinking about quantity and quality. We talked about that in the last session. And even as we're talking now, I'm thinking about, look at how long of a conversation that we've had over one verse. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. One word, right. you sent a page of notes and we've had over an hour long conversation on one verse. And we haven't even got to the notes. I mean, yeah. we kind of touched on a couple things. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just thinking about the, the amount of substance, the amount of insight, the quality of the insight that's being generated from this conversation that was inspired by one verse. And right. how that this one conversation can probably do more to transform someone's thinking, doing, and being. Yep, yep. And transform their mind. This conversation can do more than if we had just read through the whole chapter and done the standard interpretation or the standard message on what. Acts the chapter standard nine. established yeah. narrative of what yeah. you're supposed to say about Acts chapter 9. Correct. Yeah. And so in order to have a conversation like this, now this gets into something else we were talking about 
but it's very, I think it's very pertinent right now to mention this is that you had to bring certain things to the table. Mm. You like, um, you have to approach in good faith and you have to be open to different ways of thinking mm -hmm. and not everybody's there. So there's the problem. You have a lot of people who claim to be Christians, but they are ideologically possessed and they're still thinking paradigmatically. Then they're like that yeah. metanoia, that metacognition. They still mm -hmm. haven't repented. They mm -hmm. still haven't, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. They still have not escaped the paradigmatic thinking they're they're yeah. locked within a certain denominational paradigm and everything has to latch to that so that that kind of person could not do this kind of edification they yeah. can't do it i love that you say that because i've been thinking recently that repentance is we have a, such a, a narrow view or scope of what that is i think Christians change their mind about sin, and that's it. It's yeah, like, they think it's repentant. They're just repenting of smoking. Or they're like, oh, yeah, yeah I had, I, I got to say I need to repent of, you know, I need to quit committing adultery and smoking cigarettes and whatever else I had going on, looking at porn. What They're repenting from things like that, but they're not, right. they, are n they don't have a, a rapid influence in cognitive fluence, a rapid mm -hmm. increase in cognitive fluency where they can escape the modal, like the framing in mm -hmm. which they think. Yeah. They yeah. can't escape that. And that's, that's more what repentance is about. Metanoia, metacognition mm -hmm. uh, beyond yeah. the cognition where you are currently trapped inside and an unframing and a reframing, if you will, of, mm -hmm. of how you think it's like, it's like a, it's like a worldview shift Yeah, where you're not, you're not shifting to another particular worldview, but you're kind of escaping the one you're in and be able to see them all from above. Mm, this is making me think about the notes that I sent you earlier this week. <laughs> about breaking yes. the train. Yeah. So, yeah, that was an absolute heresy fest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because, boy. Don't tell all. I mean, basically what we're doing, for those of you who... Um, do not see the notes. I will not tell you specifically, but basically were her, she had notes problematizing some things that are considered to be givens. Yeah. It's almost like the equivalent to Rupert Sheldrake, who there's like certain things that are considered to be constants in, in science, like the speed of light is considered to be a constant, for example. And he's like, I don't think it is. And here's why. And so there's like 10 of those things. And his big thing is to question those it's like we we operate from the presumption that these certain things are givens. Mm -hmm. And then what your notes sent me kind of problematizes that. It's like, well, if you actually look at Scripture, there's there's nothing in Scripture that actually presents these things as givens. And um, so why do we do it? There are things in Scripture that call into question whether or not yes. those things are actually a given. And we you hear so many people say, and I... I'm not going to get into the specifics, but like I listen to other, you know, Christian presenters on YouTube and stuff. And they're like, well, we know that God is da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and so therefore, and they're creating a syllogism based on something they think they know that is really problematic. Mm -hmm. And it's a very orthodox thing. Everybody would agree to it and nod their head. Yes, we do know well, that. Yes. We, we don't know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We don't know that. Yeah. And and so, go, go, go. Oh, I was going to say it's so stigmatized. <laughs> it's so negatively st stigmatized to question these things and use first principles thinking and go back to scripture to see what it says for the first time mm -hmm. that people are afraid to do it. And they're certainly afraid to do it in public. Yeah. I mean, I, admittedly, I am. I'm a, I, I will not say some of the things that I think on this channel. <laughs> no. <laughs> that maybe I'm actually participating in a heresy fest. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, we're gonna start. We're gonna start with the participatory knowing first. Oh man! But yeah, <laughs> I, I think I was saying all that to say that when it says, you know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That renewing your mind, renewing your thinking, it's more than 
recognizing sin and changing your mind about sin and repenting from sin. Renewing your mind is knowing when to cut someone's arm off. Because specifically, specifically, <laughs> specifically that. Yes. <laughs> knowing that, well, the rules say I shouldn't cut someone's arm off, but based on the circumstances that I'm in, this is the best thing to do for that person in this situation. And renewing your mind is having the ability to exercise. Like knowing, knowing when not to take the armor into battle. Knowing when it's okay to get a tattoo on your hip. Yeah. I mean, those, those kinds of things. Those kinds of things, yeah. And I think that that plays out in our life in a lot of small and practical everyday ways that we probably don't even realize. Like sometimes I wonder how many, how many Christians or how many times in a day does someone not know what decision to make because of the mental framing that they're operating under. And it could be something small. It could be something big. Like you said, you have pancreatic cancer and you need to get a tattoo. I'm just, and it's, it's almost hard to really put into words what I'm thinking right now, but I, I have a feeling that this permeates our daily experiences more than we realize. Like if we would be, we might operate and live our lives very differently if we were able to shift our worldview and transform our thinking in a certain way. I think I think you're so right about that. And I think two things about, well, first of all, I think that's right. Second of all, I think that those believers who embrace that and try to act it out will quickly be rejected by a majority of those who currently call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not going to go for it. They're not going to get it. Yeah. It's so funny. I was, uh, so I told you earlier that I, I just moved. I just bought a house in December. <laughs> and recently, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud on the internet, but whatever. <laughs> recently I was thinking, you know, I think I might move again. <laughs> and then I was like, well, no, you just bought this house. You just moved to this area, blah, 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 blah. All of that to say, I, I had a moment of realizing, well, what are the actual rules? Where is it written that I can't move again, even though I just moved? And I have reasons yeah, why I'm yeah, considering yeah. moving, um, you know. I have reasons why I'm considering moving and I may, and I may not, but I just got into this thought process in my head of why do you think that you can't where, where is that law written? Where is that yeah, rule yeah. written that once you do, once you buy a house, you have to stay in it for X amount of years. And if you yep. don't, then yep. you're turning your life upside down or you're being unstable or you'll look Well, there crazy. are some homestead rules about having to stay in there for two years if you have a VA loan or something like that. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm saying, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that yesterday I was thinking about the whole moving thing. And then I thought about the, the concept of having freedom in Christ and then the concept of knowing the will of God. And it, I kind of link those two things together. And it occurred to me that I can do whatever I want to do as long as I'm operating within the boundaries of God's will. Yeah. And so applying that to, you know, the situation of moving, it's would I be outside of God's will if I move again, even though I just moved? No. And yet you have all of these societal norms and these social expectations that dictate how we live our lives or what we think we should do or what we think that we shouldn't do. And I think, it, like I said, I had this realization of I can do whatever I want to do as long as I'm within the boundaries of God's will, you know? Right, right. And that really kind of opened up my mind to say, realize, 
well, you can live a very different life than the standard life yes. that has been prescribed to you. You know, you go. This to is school. metanoia. Yeah, you, you yeah. escaped a certain. You didn't know that you were locked into a certain way of thinking. Yeah, and now you just you just basically reason your way out of it. Like yeah. I, I'm not trapped by that way of it. And you didn't even before you would not have described yourself as being trapped in a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But then as you think about it, as a, you realize you were, I, yeah. um, I, my wife and I gave a ride to a couple. We were coming back from Florida from a volleyball event that was there. And there was a couple that needed to go to the airport so we're chatting while they're riding with us because we were going right by the airport anyway. I mean, it took us five minutes just to swing in there and drop them off and then keep going back toward Louisiana. So um, this couple, they don't live anywhere. They both work remotely. They both work remotely. Wow. And they, they have a place that gets their mail for them. And I forget where it was. But they, tra they live places for four to six weeks at a time. And they don't live anywhere. They're always on the move. Yeah. And I could not do that. But it did make me rethink maybe how trapped I am by my stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like I was going to say earlier, we have this, especially in America, in modern day America. And I have to remind myself that the lifestyle that we have prescribed as the standard way of being is right. new. It hasn't always been this way, but here it's very much, you know, you go to school, you go to college, you get married, you buy a house, you have kids, right, right. you work, you, you get your job, you work there. there for there's like a, years, there's like a Kronos pattern mm -hmm. of how you're supposed to be. Yeah. But yeah. there's, uh, and it's a, maybe a norm on a, on a bell curve or something like that on a Gaussian distribution, but it is not something you have to do and mm -hmm. that's to to realize that you are not beholden to that is a form of metanoia yeah yeah I know, I know somebody recently who they escaped they escaped a bad situation in their life and they were following this pattern and they went exactly straight to a recreation of the exact same pattern situation Ooh. without stepping back to say I can really reach this is this is a great time of Kairos where I can really restructure things here so that I can reevaluate what's going on. Nope, none of that happened. Just right back into the same groove they were in before. Mm, no thinking really. whatsoever going on in that composite yeah. of theirs. No they're locked, they're trapped. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of Christians like like when it comes to that kind of thing, a lot of Christians are locked into what church means. Mm-hmm. They're locked into what doctrine means and they're, they're trapped in these ways of thinking and they don't even know that they they're don't trapped. Know it. Yeah. They it's so funny it. you say that because I had this day where I realized that before someone comes to Christ, you're in a delusion and you don't know that you are, you're separated from reality and you don't know that you are. And I had a moment of realizing that so the same from thing, reality. yeah, the same thing is happening to Christians. That they've only gotten closer to reality in that they have acknowledged the the base level of what Christianity is. That you know, God exists. There's sin. There's a punishment for sin. Jesus died for us. You believe in him and you'll be saved. So they've gotten closer to reality in that they have grasped that truth. But there's still a lot of ways in which they are trapped in a delusion. They're trapped in a mental framing, a way of thinking, and they don't realize it. And so it's like the only difference between some Christians and unbelievers is that they're saved. But otherwise... They're still, in certain ways, delusional. They're still not in touch with reality. And I think just having that realization, 
I don't know. It's hard to put into words. It's so um, there. There's something called the meaning crisis that a lot of the cognitive scientists and psychologists and philosophers are talking about these days. And there's uh, what you might call a consensus of agreement that people don't have meaning in their lives. And it was exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and <laughs> probably more so by the response to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and meaning in life comes with connectedness to something. Mm-hmm. And, and the it's like the more connected you are to something that feels real the more meaning you feel like you have in your life. Mm. The less connected you are, the less meaning you feel like you have in your life, the less you feel like you have a purpose or like your life matters. Yeah. And ultimately, the ultimate meaning, like you like to be connected to your kids, to your spouse, to your coworkers. There's certain kinds of connections that you have in your life. And then the ultimate connection would be if I could connect to ultimate reality somehow, which is, I mean, we call that God. If you could connect with ultimate reality. Um, that would be the highest form of meaning that I could experience in my life Mm -hmm. or the most, you know, the most meaningful connection that I have. If so, what happens in Christianity is people aren't actually connected to God. They are the in group of the church kind of serves as a proxy. Mm. So their relationship is with a set of beliefs, mm. a set of practices, rules to follow, and in-group normativity, their relationship is with that. Yeah. And there, there is no relationship to God. And what they don't realize is that the, re- the actual connection with God would have to be disruptive to those things mm-hmm. in order for it to happen. It would have to be. It's making me think get that. about Paul and you said disruptive. Yes. <laughs> yes, they think those things are the path to God or is what's connecting them to God, but it's not. Yeah. So like there's there's nothing. If you reduce Christianity to a set of metaphysical truth claims about what you think are true, or things you can't prove like heaven, hell, the Trinity and things like that. There's no checksum on reality if you get that wrong. Like if you're trying to be a mechanic or build a house and you do it wrong, the car won't work. The house will fall apart. <laughs> it's you see, but but in yeah. theology, theology is the one place where you can rise to the top of of an in-group hierarchy while having absolutely no meaning in life. While mm-hmm. having no having no, you don't have to demonstrate the veracity of the things that you're claiming. Yeah, and that and I think. So and so, instead of actually being able to check with God to see is this right, you measure your set of beliefs against acceptance by your in group. Mm-hmm. Oh, they will accept me if I say I believe in the Trinity and the deity of Christ, and that uh, baptism is by water and for believers only, and salvation. All this you say all these things, and then the in group, and then the better, and you will start to shift your beliefs toward the center of the in group and then toward that, which will get you elevated by the in group. And it's really more about the in group than the stuff. Yeah. But if we were to shift to instead of the set of beliefs and instead of the institutional version of the church, if we shift over to the transformation, Hmm. there is a check sum on reality. You shall know them by their fruits. There Mm -hmm. is. Is this person transformed? Mm-hmm. You can you can check yourself out. You know, after after a while, people start to say, you know, you're a little different than you were before. I had somebody tell me that recently. They're like, uh, and it wasn't even somebody that knows me other than online. They it's like I watched your videos from before, and then I saw this, this, this and this, and then this debate with so and so, and it's like you're different now than you were before by far, you know, and that's, it's, it's kind of amazing for somebody else to come out and say that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying, I'm not claiming to have accomplished anything or attained any goal or anything like that. But like that kind of thing where mm-hmm. you can look and see that there has been a change in you because of your connection with reality. It's, there's it's so yeah. much there, and it's, it's hard to convey to people. Cause yeah. 
it's, it's one making of those things that it, once you can see clearly, you don't need it explained. But if you haven't seen it clearly, no explanation helps. It's making me think about um, Jesus's ministry. And it's like the more truth that he told, the fewer people that followed him. And then he finally gets to this point, if I'm remembering it correctly, where it's just him and his um, disciples. And even to the people who understood him more than anyone else, even to the people who were tracking what he was saying more than anyone else, he said to them, I'm thinking it's in John 17, may be wrong, maybe not. He said something along the lines of, there's many more things that I have to say to you, but you John can't 16, bear 12. them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like the more truth that he told, the fewer people understood him, the fewer people that followed him. And even the people who understood and were tracking what he was saying more than anyone else, there were still things that they he knew they could not grasp that they could not yeah. understand um, and so it's making me think that there are levels and layers and depth yeah. to truth to sound like and a reality now what'd you say <laughs> you're, starting to, you're starting to sound like a a kabbalist a jewish kabbalist yikes they got four <laughs> layers of truth they call it the orchard i think there okay. is a, a sense but you're converging on the same idea. Yeah, yeah. There's a sense in which there are different degrees of understanding. Paul, this is what this is what Paul is getting at in First Corinthians chapter two and three. You're carnal and you can't take this wisdom. Mm -hmm. You're not ready for it yet. Yeah, and the these are man, more believers. Yeah. yeah, these are believers, but they're carnal and they're natural and they can't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're not ready for them yet. Yeah, exactly. So and when go ahead. I was going to say, I think people don't actually practically understand what that means and how to go about getting to a deeper level of understanding and truth and connection with reality. I think people don't know how to do that. And maybe that has something to do with the mental framing. Somebody asked me that recently. Um, what does it take to be the kind of person that can receive the things of the Spirit of God? Mm. And you just said something about the levels. And that's, that's, that's a great way to envision it because I'm, I'm trying to think of a reciprocal opening on our Wednesday night session. Roberta said uh, this phrase, reciprocal transformation. That's mm. so ingenious. It's so <laughs> it's so it's so insight provoking. Mm. And there's this the Bible is a strange book to where the more you interact with it, the and your life. You see, it's there you have to take what it says and you have to take it back into all the way into participation, mm -hmm. then you have to come back to it. Mm -hmm. And then there's something there that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. And then you do it again. And then you do it again. And after you do that for a year, say, or three months or five years, there's this greater qualitative capacity to grasp insights that you did not have before. Yeah. And so as you grow and become perfected, and then, and then that interaction also is with other Christians with distributed cognition, like what we're doing right here and with the people who are watching this, there is that reciprocal transformation happening between us and then we're growing and then they will that right now there's a truth that god has for us that we cannot receive right now i don't know what that is right but, may, but the more we do this and the more we keep interacting with this book that time will come mm -hmm. the time will come we'll be ready to receive that and you yeah. can't receive it right now. And that's one of the challenges of Christian ministry is dealing with a bunch of people who have basically been programmed to be unable to receive things. And then when you try to share it with people, they don't get it. Man, it's there's... almost like you have to do some kind of guildcraft participatory thing to show people first. <laughs> I don't there's know how to do it. scripture in Job and I can't remember it. 
And so I have a, various Bibles. And there's this one Bible that I have that I wish I had in front of me and I don't know. I don't have it, but I can think of a scripture and, and you kind of remember I where know, it is on the page. I know where it and is. Like, on like the page. you, you marked it out or something and you know where it is in that Bible. Yes. Yep. And yep. I, unfortunately that's an ESV. So I just got my first KJV. <laughs> I'm trying to wean myself off the ESV, but I want to reference this verse in Job. Do you know what it's talking about? It's talking about wisdom and understanding, which she talks about a lot. So that doesn't help. I'm trying to Google it because usually I can Google. But basically what he's saying, and I remember the note that I wrote when I read the verse. The note that I wrote was something along the lines of, Wisdom is knowing a thing and understanding is knowing what to do in light of that thing. And I really wish I could remember. I know it's verse one of some chapter, but I don't know which chapter. (laughs) It has to be in the teens or the 20s because I was reading it recently. Oh, I'm trying to search it and I can't find it and I don't remember. So knowledge is knowing a thing and understanding is knowing what to do in light of that thing. Yes. Yes. Because, and I, I got that. You you kind of got that idea from the verse. Yes. I got that from the structure of the verse. I know whatever chapter it is, it's the first, maybe the first and second verses in that chapter. Yeah. Man. Yeah, I'm not finding it right now off the top of my head anyway, either. Yeah. Off the uh, off the initial search for the word understanding in the book of Job. Yeah, I'll look it up and put it in the comments yeah. when you post the video. Man. Yeah, like I said, he talks about wisdom and understanding a lot, so that's so not specific. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to right, find. Right. But that was what I took out of that is knowing a thing versus knowing what to do in light of that thing. And I think in Christianity, we're in a, we're in a state where we know the thing and we're not doing all of what we ought to be doing in light of that thing. We're doing some. I I don't want to negate what you just said, Mm. but I do want to add a third dimension to it Mm -hmm. where knowledge wisdom and understanding and knowledge so what i've understood in the past and this could be wrong but at least there at least these three dimensions are still applicable where knowledge is knowing a thing and wisdom understanding is under is knowing the relationship of that thing to other things Mm -hmm. and then wisdom is knowing what to do with the knowledge and the understanding yeah. With knowing what the thing is and what its relationship to other things are. And wisdom would be knowing how to employ that. Yeah. But that, that whole concept would be, there is, there is a relational awareness, a knowledge awareness, and then a doing awareness. And then as you incorporate those, it's the way to be. It's a being thing. Hmm. So much is going through my head right now. <laughs> you want to uh, you want to try to summarize some final thoughts. Uh, we've been going for a little over an hour and a half, and uh, yeah. I had an hour in mind for this. <laughs> and that's the thing; we could truly go on and on and on. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a bathroom installed in here, and so we can just uh, <laughs> marathon, yeah. baby. I'm going to put a fridge gonna, over here, get a bathroom. I'm going to have everything I need right here on video. Yeah. <laughs> as long as I just film from here up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can paint anything thoughts. green. <laughs> final thoughts. <laughs> hmm. <sighs> so many. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we shared a whole bunch of them already. Um, yeah, we're interested in this qualitative transformation. 
stemming from this question, Paul asks, what wilt thou have me to do? I want to talk a little bit about charity. I might do a separate video on that, and then we could talk about it afterwards. But uh, kind of what charity has, the relationship of agape to anagage, that, that charity that pulls, like God's charity and the charity of other Christians, it kind of pulls you toward the growth that you need to do. Mm-hmm. and the transformation that you need to do because I really wanted I, I feel strongly about some of that stuff and I feel like I just saw something in 1 Corinthians 13 last night that I had not noticed before mm. <laughs> so we'll have to hit on all that um, Yeah. you ready to wrap it up? I think I'm about ready to wrap it up alrighty I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I guess we'll wrap it up then so for everybody watching uh Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day. Bye.